Today we're going to start the respiratory system unit. So with the respiratory system, this is going to consist of all parts that bring in the air and transport it to the microscopic alveoli where gases are going to be exchanged. This is going to actually occur in the lungs. So there's some different terms that you're going to need to know with these. Respiration is going to be the entire process of exchanging gases between the atmosphere and the body cells. Ventilation is going to be the physical movement of air into and out of the lungs. Gas exchange is the movement of gases across the respiratory membrane into the blood cells of the lungs. And then cellular respiration is using oxygen and food to make ATP. Now organs of the respiratory system are going to consist of the respiratory tract and it can be divided into two different groups. You have what's referred to as an upper respiratory tract and a lower respiratory tract. And sometimes when you go to the doctor or physician, they may refer to it as you having an upper respiratory infection or you could have a lower respiratory infection. And so this is what it's consisting of. If it's the upper respiratory tract, that's going to consist of the nose, nasal cavity, sinuses or pharynx. So if you have a sinus infection, it would be considered an upper respiratory infection. If you have an infection in the pharynx, which is going to be the throat, then that still would be part of the upper respiratory tract. Lower respiratory tract will consist of the larynx, trachea, bronchial tree, and lungs. So looking at these, here's a diagram that's going to show you the upper respiratory system. So going into the nose, through the nasal passage, you have the nasal cavity, which opens up. You see the nasal concha, which are going to be in there. So the nasal concha are going to be these divisions here. They're kind of scroll-like. They're going to be important because they increase surface area, which helps to moisten and warm the air as it's coming into the body, as well as clean out any debris by using nasal hairs and mucus to help sweep and clean that air as it comes through. And then as you go in further into the actual skull, you will see that you have sinus openings. This is going to help to lighten the skull. It also helps with resonance of sound and voice as it comes in. But as we all know, these chambers can become filled with mucus and fluid and overfill with an overgrowth of bacteria, which would lead to a sinus infection. Now with the pharynx, that is going to be the opening that starts back in this area and comes all the way down to this area. Now, depending on what part you're in depends on what it's referred to as. If it's the section behind the nasal cavity, that's referred to as the nasopharynx. If it's the section behind the oral cavity, that's the oropharynx. If it goes down closer to the larynx section, the larynx is going to be here. If it goes down to this section, this would be the laryngopharynx. And so the pharynx can be divided up into three sections, but they're all still a Pharynx. The pharynx is simply going to be a shared passageway for air and for food. Coming further down, you see the larynx. This is going to be where it divides off. And so here you see this flap, that's your epiglottis. The epiglottis, when you swallow, if you're swallowing food or if you're swallowing liquids, it will close off this opening here, this hole that you see. That's the glottis. So as it closes it off, it keeps that those substances from coming into the airway. Normally, the epiglottis is going to be open, and so you can come directly in, and then you're going to go down through the larynx into what you know as your trachea. And so that's the flow that air will take. This is going to be part of the lower respiratory system. So from the larynx, it goes, remember the epiglottis stays open, goes through the glottis into the larynx, then through the trachea. It eventually, as it gets further down, is going to divide up and it's going to go into the bronchus. And so it could go either to the right or it could go to the left. And either way, it's going to go either to the right lung or to the left lung. And then from there, it goes into these smaller tubes called bronchioles. And then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller till it makes it to the air sacs, which are referred to as the alveoli. So starting out with the nose, the nose is going to be supported by bone and cartilage. It provides an entrance for air in which the air is going to be filtered by coarse hairs that are inside the nostrils. Now remember, along with those coarse hairs, you are going to have mucus, and that mucus is going to also help to trap those pathogens along with warming the air and moistening it. Now notice the nasal dorsum. 
which is going to be on the top. It, the nasal bone is actually made of two bones there, and you see that it's sutured together right through the center at that dorsum. The apex of the nose and on the side you're going to have there are going to be what's for, going to be made up of cartilage. So you have your nasal cartilage is there and you have the external nares, which are going to be your nostrils. So the nasal cavity is going to be a space that's going to be posterior to the nose that is divided medially by the nasal septum. If you remember from biology 141, or the first part of anatomy, it is going to be made up of two bones. So coming up from the bottom portion is going to be the vomer. Coming down from the upper portion is going to be the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. So those together will come together and make up the nasal septum. Nasal concha are going to divide the cavity into passageways that are going to be lined with mucous membranes and they're going to help, like I said, to increase that surface area and that's available to warm and filter that incoming air as well as moisten it. Particles get trapped in that mucus and are going to be carried to the pharynx by ciliary action. So ciliary action is going to be the movement of these hairs that will sweep it into the pharynx. Now the goal of that sweeping or ciliary action going into the pharynx is hopefully it will be swallowed. Once it's swallowed, it becomes um, it gets carried to the stomach where the gastric juices are going to destroy any of those microorganisms that were caught in the mucus. So looking here, this is going to be what's referred to as a frontal or coronal cut. In here, you're going to see what the actual nasal conca look like. You see how it's a scroll-like structure and how that can actually help increase the surface area. Now going into the um, cilia that you're looking here on the epithelial surface, that's going to be found inside the um, respiratory system, respiratory tract. You'll see how it can work in a sweeping motion. It looks like actual furry or hairy-like structure. This is actually going to work in that oar-like or wave-like motion to get the mucus up that contains possible microorganisms and hopefully get you to put it into the esophagus or back into the pharynx where it's going to go down the esophagus and make its way to the stomach where it can destroy those microorganisms in the gastric juices. Now the paranasal sinuses are simply going to be air-filled spaces within the max maxillary, frontal, ethmoid, or sphenoid bones of the skull. These spaces open to nasal cavities and are lined with mucous membranes that's going to be continuous with the lining of that nasal cavity. The sinuses will reduce the weight of the skull and they also serve as resonance chambers to affect the quality and sound of the voice. The pharynx is going to be a common passageway, like I said, for air and for food. The pharynx is going to aid in producing sounds for speech. And the pharynx also houses the tonsils, which are going to be part of the immune system. Remember, those tonsils are going to be simple crypts that the microorganisms will be able to get to in small numbers. That way, the body can learn those microorganisms and create antibodies to attack it in the future if it recognizes them. So here is another visual showing you the nasal passageway. It shows you the concha. You have three, the superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha. It shows you the nasal cavity and the openings towards the back. It shows you how the pharynx comes together. And coming on down, the pharynx will split off and either become the epiglottis or go towards the larynx and turn into the trachea. The larynx is going to be an enlargement of the airway superior to the trachea, so it will be in front of the trachea, and it's going to be inferior to the pharynx, so it's going to be below the pharynx. It's going to help keep particles from entering the trachea and also houses the vocal cords. So the larynx is often referred to as the voice box. Here's going to be a visual of what it looks like. So you see the epiglottis, that's going to be that part there that's going to cover the opening that goes into this airway or passageway, which is the glottis. It's attached in with a hyoid bone and it's going to be held there with what's known as the thyroid membrane. Now the epiglottis, when you see the back portion or posterior portion, which is going to be on the right hand side, is made up of what's referred to as the leaf and stem. So the leaf portion is going to be attached to that hyoid bone, and then the stem is going to have 
that little ligament there, or it's made up of that ligament, that's going to attach into that thyroid cartilage. Often, this is going to be larger in males and is referred to as the Adam's apple. On the sides of that um, little stem there, you're going to see what's referred to as the retinoid cartilage. And then coming on down, you see the cricoid cartilage. And then you see the thyroid gland is going to be wrapped around right underneath that thyroid car cartilage there. That thyroid gland is going to be very, very important in regulating things such as your metabolic, basal metabolic rate and other things within the body. On the back side of the thyroid, you see that you have your parathyroid glands, and they're going to be important in regulating calcium. Underneath, you also see that there are C-shaped rings of cartilage. Those C-shaped rings of cartilage help to keep the trachea open and from collapsing. And so they don't go all the way around. They just go um, about three-fourths of the way around, as you can see here. Now that back section is going to be open, and what's going to be posteriorly or behind that, but it's not showing, would be the um, esophagus that heads or makes its way to the stomach. So inside the larynx, you're going to have two pairs of folds of muscles and connective tissue that's going to be covered with mucous membranes that make up what we know as the vocal cords. The upper pairs are called the false vocal cords. They are not there. They don't produce any sound. That's why they're referred to as false vocal cords. The lower pair is going to be the true vocal cords. These are going to be the ones that help to create and make sound. By changing the tension on the vocal cords, that's going to control things such as pitch, and it's going to increase the loudness, and that depends on increasing the force of that vibrating air that's going across the vocal cords. During normal breathing, the vocal cords are going to be relaxed, and the glottis is going to be in a triangular slit when you look at it from a top view. During swallowing, those false vocal cords and the epiglottis are going to close off the glottis to make sure that no food or liquid debris gets into the actual airway. So this is what it looks like. They did a frontal section. That's where they cut it in half or cut it across and make a front and back section or a interior posterior section. And so here's what it looks like inside. Now this is looking at the vocal folds and the um, vestibular folds that are going to be there, sorry. And so the top movement of the vocal folds apart or abduction, opening up, you see how it makes kind of that triangular fold. And then as it's being closed or adduction or it comes together there. This is what it actually looks like in a person. So if they were to actually have a laryngoscope positioned in their oropharynx, looking at the um, folds, this is what it would look like. Of course, the glottis is going to be the opening, and you have the vocal folds that, folds that go around it. The trachea is going to extend downward, anterior to the esophagus, and into the thoracic cavity. This is where it's going to split into either a right or a left bronchi or bronchi. The inner wall of the trachea is going to be lined with ciliated mucous membrane that has a lot of those goblet cells. Goblet cells are important because they create mucus. And so that mucus is going to be important for trapping any particles that were breathed in. So here's what it's going to look like. You come down straight from the trachea and it's going to break into the, either the right or left bronchi. Right there where it splits or there's a fork in a road, that's referred to as the carina of the trachea. So know that that's your carina. Looking inside, if you look over to the larger picture that's on the right hand side, you see how the esophagus goes along the posterior section or the back of the trachea. It's against the section of the trachea that does not have that C-shaped cartilage. Then, you, of course, you see the C-shaped cartilage, which is going to keep that airway open. And that open space or that open tunnel is referred to as the lumen. So that's the lumen of the trachea. Okay, this is going to be an up-close version vision of this. You see you have ciliated columnar epithelium. 
these cilia are going to act in wave-like, rhythmic, or like motions, which are going to move mucus that's created by the mucus glands or the goblet cells that are there. And that's going to help to move it up towards the pharynx. So when you cough, you clear your voice, um, you sneeze, things like that. That's going to help to bring that mucus up into the pharynx, and then you should swallow it or spit it out. Now with the bronchial tree, it's going to consist of branch tubes that lead from the trachea to the alveoli. The bronchial tree begins with two primary bronchi, each leading to a lung. These branches of, bronch of the bronchial tree from the trachea are going to be right and left primary bronchi. These further subdivide into bronchioles, which give rise into alveolar ducts, which then terminate into the alveoli. It is going to be through the thin epithelial cells of the alveoli that gas exchange is going to occur. And so that's where the oxygen is going to come in and go into the um, bloodstream and attach to the red blood cells. And carbon dioxide is going to be released into the alveoli in order to be breathed out. All of this occurs at the respiratory membrane. So you need to know that gas exchange occurs at the respiratory membrane in the alveoli. So looking here, noticing the differences with the right bronchi, or lung, sorry, notice that it's going to be divided into three lobes. So you have three lobes on the right, and it shows you the bronchial pulmonary segments that are going to be in each one. It has them color-coded. And the left side, you're going to have two lobes. And so here's going from largest to small. You have the trachea. It then breaks off into, this one's just showing you the left main bronchus. Then it can break off into even smaller segments. So you see the segmental bronchi. And then it goes from smaller, smaller, smaller. So you can go from primary, primary to secondary to tertiary on down into the terminal bronchioles, which then end up at the respiratory bronchial and then go into the alveoli. This picture here shows you the different construct of these tubes in the air system. So once you get down to the bronchioles, notice how it has that respiratory epithelium. It's going to have arteries, it's going to have veins, and it's going to have um, the uh, sorry lymphatic system that runs along with it. So all of these vessels are going to run along in order for gas exchange and in order to keep things um, cleaned out as far as the immune system. Notice how the capillaries are going to go around each alveoli. And so I'm going to circle it here on this one. It's going to go across. So the carbon dioxide is going to be brought in from the heart. It's brought in. It leaves, goes into the open space of the alveoli. The oxygen is picked up. And so it changes into a brighter red color. And so that's going to be the artery. At the smallest section of the artery, it's referred to as an arteriole. And so the arteriole goes into the pulmonary artery, which makes its way back to the heart, which then will pump it around the body in the systemic circulation. Also notice in with this, you're going to have bands of elastic fibers that are going to surround these alveoli. These bands of elastic fibers allow it to stretch, but also allow it to recoil and return to its normal size after you've inhaled and then exhaled. Another thing that you're going to notice that I didn't point out in the other picture, but going around these bronchi bronchioles, you see smooth muscle. Now the smooth muscle, remember, it's going to be involuntary, so it's controlled by the nervous system, and it can allow for the opening or the constriction of these tubes that are heading to each of the alveoli. And so these are going to be the different airways that you that can become constricted during asthma or that you might need to open up when you're using your inhaler. Okay, so this is going to be a closer look. Now the alveoli are only going to be one cell thick. They're going to be made up of a simple squamous epithelium. And you can see this in the histology picture that's over to the right hand side. That's actually a slide of a very thin slice of the um, alveolar ducts and the alveoli there. 
So you can see how thin it is. And that's going to be very important because the thinner it is, the easier it is for the carbon dioxide to diffuse out so you can breathe it out and the oxygen to diffuse in across that membrane into the bloodstream in order to be carried around the body. So with the lungs, the right and left are going to be made up of soft, spongy, cone-shaped. Um, they're going to be separated medially by the mediastinum, which is located in the center of the chest, and is enclosed by the diaphragm and the thoracic cage. The bronchus and large blood vessels are going to enter each lung. The visceral pleura is going to be attached to the lung, and the parietal pleura is going to line the outside thoracic cavity. It's going to have a serous fluid that's going to be in between these two layers that's going to help to lubricate the pleural cavity between these two membranes. The right lung has three lobes like we saw, and the left lung you need to remember has two. Each lobe is going to be composed of lobules that contain air passages, alveoli, nerves, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and connective tissue. So looking here, notice that the apex of the lungs is going to be towards the top, and then you're going to have the base of the lungs or the flatter sections towards the bottom. Looking over, remember that the right lung is going to have the three lobes, and the left lung is going to have two lobes. Now they're going to be divided by what's known as fissures. So the one that divides the top lobe from the middle is going to be referred to as the horizontal fissure. The one that divides going across is going to be referred to as the oblique fissure. Now looking at these from the inside, where they're going to attach in with the vessel. So both of these would be attaching in medially, and you can see this section often referred to as the hilum or hilum, and that's going to be a slight groove. Notice there is going to be a cardiac notch, a section for the heart to fit in. And then with this groove, you're going to see that it's going to have openings for the bronchus, for the pulmonary artery, the pulmonary veins, and you're going to have a um, addiction, like I said, for the heart to go in. Now, this is going to be a transverse section looking at a cadaver, and this will show you what it looks like in retrospect to the vena cavas, to the heart, or the vessels above the heart coming in, and you see what the lungs look like when they're cut across. Breathing mechanism. Ventilation is going to be referring to breathing. It's going to be the movement of air in and out of the lungs and is composed of inspiration and expiration. Inspiration is atmospheric pressure is going to be forcing the movement of air into the lungs. Uh, when the pressure on the inside of the lungs decreases, higher pressure of air is going to flow in from the outside. So if the pressure is low inside, it's going to force the air from the outside in. When air pressure inside of the lungs decrease by increasing the size of the thoracic cavity due to the surface tension between the two layers of pleura, the lungs follow with the chest wall expanding. Muscles involved in expanding the thoracic cavity are going to include the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. Now the muscles for breathing are going to be the last muscles to go into atrophy during um, any type of illness such as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So as the lungs expand in size, you're going to have a fluid inside called surfactant. Surfactant is going to keep the alveoli from sticking to each other so they don't collapse when the internal air pressure is going to be low. So think of this almost like a dish detergent that keeps them from sticking together and keeps them from not wanting to open. So it's going to be a very, very important fluid that you're going to find inside the alveoli. Next, we have expiration. The forces of expiration are due to the elastic recoil of lung and muscle tissue and form the surface tension within the alveoli. So remember when we looked at the picture of each one of those alveoli and they had the elastic fibers around it, that's what's going to help with that recoil. Forced expiration is going to be aided by the thoracic and abdominal wall muscles that compress the abdomen against the diaphragm. So you can naturally breathe out or you can breathe out in an additional amount, which is gonna be the forced expiration. So looking here, you see the intra-alveolar pressure at 760 millime millimeters of mercury. And so notice the diaphragm's there. Then you're gonna notice the expansion of the chest 
and as it expands, you see that intra-alveolar pressure there at 758. So at rest, this is what these muscles look like. Notice, pay attention to the diaphragm and those intercostal muscles. When the rib cage and the diaphragm are at rest, the pressure inside and outside the lungs are going to be equal. So there's going to be no air movement occurring here. Now with inhalation, you have elevation of the rib cage and contraction of the diaphragm. It's going to increase the volume of the thoracic cavity and pressure within the lungs decreases and that's going to cause air to flow in. With exhalation, you're going to have the rib cage return to its original position and the diaphragm is going to relax. The volume of that thoracic cavity is going to decrease. So pressure within the lungs increases and then the air moves out. This is showing you the difference in those intercostal muscles or the muscles of inhalation versus the muscles of exhalation. So if you're inhaling, notice how they're going upwards and then the diaphragm's being pulled down. Notice how during exhalation, those muscles are in the intercostals are going down while the diaphragm is going up. And here's another view. Inhalation, it gets pulled down. Exhalation, it gets pulled up. And so think of the air is always going to go towards the area that has the lowest pressure. It wants to go from area of high to low. So if you're ever confused which way the air is moving, look at the air, whichever way it's lower, the air is going to move towards that area. So respiratory air volumes and capacities. The measurement of different air volumes is going to be called spirometry, and it's going to describe four distinct respiratory volumes. One inspiration followed by an expiration is going to be called a respiratory cycle. So breathing in and out once is your respiratory cycle. The amount of air that enters and leaves the lungs during one respiratory cycle is going to be referred to as the tidal volume. During forced inspiration, an additional volume, the inspiratory reserve volume, can be inhaled into the lungs. And so you see that reserve volume and tidal volume is going to give you the inspiratory capacity. So you add those two together. During a maximal forced expiration, an expiratory reserve volume can be exhaled, but there remains a residual volume in the lungs. So by adding the two together, that's going to give you the functional reserve capacity. Vital capacity is going to be the tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve and expiratory reserve volumes combined. And then vital capacity plus residual volume is going to be your total lung capacity. So that's how you'll figure out those quantities. And so here you can see in this visual or this chart, it shows you the total volume at 500 milliliters. If you have the forced <clears throat> exhalation, notice how it goes down to 2,000 milliliters. Normally it stays around the 3,000 area and goes up and down only 500 milliliters. If you have the forced inhalation, notice how it can go up to the 6,000 milliliter volume. And then it returns to the average 500 milliliter. Control of breathing. <clears throat> so normal breathing is going to be a rhythmic and voluntary act even though the muscles are going to be under voluntary control. So this is going to be an act that you don't have to think about. The respiratory center or groups of neurons in the brain stem are going to comprise the respiratory, what we refer to as respiratory center. This controls breathing by causing inspiration and expiration by adjusting the rate and depth of breathing. The components of the respiratory center include the rhythmic center of the medulla and the pneumotoxic center of the pons or area of the pons. So if you're asked this question on a test, what parts are going to control or what parts of the respiratory center control breathing, you're going to say the medulla and the pons. The medullary rhythmicity centers include two groups of neurons. You have the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group. Now with the dorsal respiratory group, it's going to be responsible for basic rhythm of breathing. The ventral respiratory group is active when you have more forceful breathing that is going to be required. So neurons in this pneumotaxic area control the rate of breathing. And so this is showing you a visual inside of the brain. 
And so you have your respiratory center there. You see the pons and you see the medulla or what's often referred to as the medulla oblongata if you want to say the entire name. And it shows you these sections of or what muscles that get activated or controlled by these centers. Factors that affect breathing are going to be things such as chemicals that you find in the bloodstream that make their way to the lungs. So the lung tissue will stretch. It could be due to emotional states that affect breathing, or it could be due to some type of um, exercise because you'll have chemosensitive areas or chemoreceptors that are going to pick up on these things. So if you exercise a lot, you're going to have a buildup of carbon dioxide. That buildup of carbon dioxide will cause the pH in the bloodstream to go down, and then that's going to cause you to increase your respiratory rate. So you have what we said, these chemosensitive areas that are going to be sensitive to the changes in the blood concentration of, we said the carbon dioxide, but also hydrogen ions. And so if either the carbon dioxide or hydrogen ion concentrations rise, those central chemoreceptors signal to the respiratory center that breathing rate needs to increase. Now, if the pH in the blood or if these start to level off and it goes back to normal or homeostatic balance, then the rate of breathing will decrease. Peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid sinuses and aortic arch will sense changes in blood oxygen concentration. It transmits impulses to the respiratory center and then the breathing rate and tidal volume increase. An inflation reflex will trigger the stretch receptors in the visceral pleura, bronchioles, and alveoli, and that's going to help to prevent overinflation of the lungs during forceful breathing. This is where we're going to stop with part one of the respiratory system. We'll pick up where we left off with part two in the next video.